one o'clock. Um, so we'll begin. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, this month's Tindall Manchester seminar. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by Stephen Weird uh, from Atkins. Uh, we'll give a brief introduction to um, Steve and then um, without much further ado, we'll, we'll get into his talk uh, as soon as possible. There will be time for uh, questions uh, after Stephen's talk and we'll uh, take those either, if you can add them to the chat function uh, so towards the end of the talk, just in case things are answered as the talk goes on uh, in, in the first instance or um, use the hand raising function uh, in Zoom to indicate if you have um, a question for Stephen um, once once the talk is finished. Um, so as many of you know, the, this part of a seminar series at Tindall Manchester hosts on a wide range of issues to do with uh, climate change, um, uh, reflecting Tindall Manchester's um, interdisciplinary uh, interests in a wide range of climate change related issues. And Stephen is uh, the, an associate director for climate resilience at Atkins, um, having previously worked with HR, Wallingford and Met Office and um, his, his expertise and skills cover a wide range from water resources, climate resilience, linked to uh, various systems such as water, energy and transport, um, and is therefore the, the technical lead for weather and climate services at Atkins. Um, as well as that, and particularly relevant to this call uh, today, um, uh, Stephen has a great deal of experience working with the, the Asian Development, uh, Sustainable Development and Climate Change team, um, uh, sorry, uh, the Asian Development Bank. Um, so uh, a, great, a great great wealth of, of experience and, um, and insight on climate finance, risk assessment uh, and, and services. Um, from that. So we look forward to, to hear from Stephen um, and please add your questions to the, the chat as we go along. Um, so Stephen, could you um, could you start us off, please? OK, thank you very much, Christopher. So um, as for the introduction, I work for Atkins, which is a consultancy firm, and I lead a, a climate futures team, which does a lot of work for multilateral development banks, um, mostly in the area of climate finance and risk assessment. And today in this presentation, I wanted to give some insight into really my practical experience of working for banks. Um, and that's partly in response to quite a lot of um, recent criticism that I've seen on social media and in the academic literature um, that has painted quite a negative view of climate finance and the overall system and, and how it's performing. So, the context of this is that the Paris Agreement stipulates the need for financial flows from developed to developing countries. So the stated need just for adaptation finance is 100 billion US dollars per, per year. And the multilateral development banks um, are making increasing commitments to sustainable finance and climate action. So they're funding both mitigation and adaptation projects. And, um, you know, the, the, the amount of funding is growing very, very rapidly. But at the same time, some of the criticism that's been received is from organisations like the United Nations Environment Programme that have highlighted in, a, in quite a comprehensive report recently that despite the increase in finance, the gap or the adaptation finance gap is, is not closing, um, the, the problem's getting, getting bigger and that the providers of finance are not integrating their adaptation activities well enough across their businesses. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, academics are criticising the sort of climate finance infrastructure, arguing that many current um, adaptation activities actually create new vulnerability. And that's um, argued that it's a result of understanding um, the complexity of the vulnerability context not involving stakeholders in, um, in the design of projects or the right stakeholders in the design of projects, um, retrofitting sort of adaptation at the end of a sort of standard development project, and also insufficient conceptualization of what 
um, adaptation success should actually look like. So, you know, I'm going to reflect on some of that and, uh, and as well, finally, an another piece of evidence that was highlighted recently, CARE, which is an NGO, um, recently published a report that um, following a kind of review of, uh, of publicly available information argued that climate finance for adaptation is overstated. Um, significantly. So they've argued that only about 58% of the finance attributed to adaptation is actually genuine. And they've highlighted that, that perhaps the biggest offenders in that regard are the um, Japanese government and the World Bank. So in that context, um, you know, I, I'm going to provide a sort of more of a practitioner's view. Um, you know, it's a bit more positive, highlighting some good progress that I think has been made as well as reflecting on some of those criticisms and talking about maybe what else can be done to improve the overall system. And I suppose at this point, I should point out that all the views kind of expressed in here are my own views um, based on my experience and also some reflections from across my team. Um, so none of what I'm saying is, is, is endorsed by any, um, any of the MDBs di directly. So for those um, sort of not familiar, just some basic background on understanding climate finance flows. Um, climate finance includes grant aid, loans, credits, guarantees, lots of different financial mechanisms, and it's much greater um, than just overseas development assistance alone. Um, most lending from multilateral development banks is for mitigation. Um, typically, adaptation lending is 10 or 20 percent of the um, climate action. Um, most adaptation in lower income countries is linked to urban development and water infrastructure. If we look at all the banks, the European Investment Bank, which has now become really the European Climate Bank is the biggest overall lender. Um, and the World Bank is the biggest lender to middle and low income countries. And all of the banks, all of the major ones are moving towards a situation where they uh, argue that, or they're aiming for 30 to 40% of their investment is climate action. And in fact, the European Investment Bank is on a journey um, that's much more ambitious. And I think it's moving towards a situation where all finance um, will need to contribute towards net zero climate resilience and demonstrate that it does um, no significant harm. And just an example on the right of some of the flows of information, this is just one um, particular type of loan. It's, the, it's to do with the external lending of the European Investment Bank um, outside of Europe. And just to give you a, a, a sense there, this is um, in millions of euros and the adaptation lending is really quite small on the bottom right there compared to the mitigation lending. And if you look at that flow, uh, back from adaptation, it's mostly in the kind of water, agriculture and built environment sectors. So climate screening. Um, so how do, how do the banks screen risks and manage within their portfolios? Um, really some basic background, and this is true for almost all MDBs, incorporate the screening of projects for climate risks in their processes and at any stage where risks are deemed as medium or high require climate risk assessment, as well as all the normal social and environmental safeguards activities such as um, ESIAs. Now, some banks rely on proprietary tools for climate screening. That's sometimes called out as an issue um, with respect to how accurate they really, they really are. Um, many MDBs provide additional technical assistance to those who are borrowing the money and that's using either national consultants or international consultants to provide the due diligence related to climate risks. And although most of this work is at the sort of early sort of design stages of projects, um, there is a requirement for monitoring of adaptation spend and adaptation activity. And that can be mandated as part of legal agreements on, on loans. The, the, the example I'm showing here is just a, a, an overall summary of the Asian Development Bank system that shows that you go through a process that uses checklists and screening tools. Um, if a project is deemed medium or high risk, you have to do a risk assessment. You have to identify 
um, climate adaptation measures or disaster resilient measures, and you have to implement some kind of monitoring um, downstream. And just to say, I mean, ADB is the one that I'm working mostly with in my team, but we've been heavily involved in um, developing processes at the European Investment Bank and actually making sure that this is all you know, entirely integrated into all of their banking systems. So they cannot lend any money without going through a detailed due diligence process. So risk assessments, um, just I'm going to I'm going to go through and provide a few examples of projects, the first focusing on more on risk assessment and the later ones a bit more on, on the climate finance part. Um, they're all ADB examples, um, the ones I'm most familiar with, but just some, some background of what a risk assessment really provides in a banking context. Um, the approach is taken and guided by kind of international best practice and guidance material um, or specific bank guidance. And typically, um, a risk assessment has to present the climate vulnerability context. It has to show the intent for the project to, um, to respond to climate change and direct links between the activities on the project and specific mitigation or adaptation outcomes or outputs at least. <coughs> Most of the time that includes a high level assessment of risks and an estimation of climate finance on each, um, each loan. And in this area, there's a whole range of, I suppose, climate products and services um, that are available to support the risk assessment process. Um, with regard to my team, we're often working in areas with quite limited information on the ground. So we make a lot of use of um, global reanalysis products. So this is where um, you know, climate models are used to look at the historical climate um, from centers like the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. We make a lot of use of bias corrected global and regional climate models, which we either prepare in our team or we rely on some of the services developed by, by others, particularly at the moment, um, the Copernicus Climate Change Service, which is um, bringing out more and more products in this space. And the outputs of a CRA are typically a report, um, a summary of adaptation and climate finance. Um, but the whole process also involves a fair amount of capacity building for both beneficiary governments, national consultants and working with, um, with, with colleagues in, in the banks. So just some projects. Um, one of the early ones I worked on um, was a, a water efficiency improvement project in Vietnam. So after the El Nino events of 2015, um, there was a lot of provinces in central and southern uh, Vietnam that were affected by drought. ADB provided a loan for irrigation infrastructure um, of the order of $100 million or so, and that um, promoted various climate adaptation options, including water efficiency, drip irrigation, the provision of some weather and climate services, as well as institutional strengthening and capacity building. Um, and this particular project, um, this one, the, the risk assessment has been turned into an, a knowledge product. So that's available on the ADB website. Um, the success, I think, of that CRA was that we managed to work with um, the Vietnam Met Service and include their national climate change scenarios in the assessments. Um, we identified the importance of making sure a lot of the irrigation network was resilient to flooding. Uh, which hadn't been adequately considered. Um, and we also had a, had a strong, um, strong eye out really for making sure that the most disadvantaged farming groups in the area benefited from that, uh, from those irrigation schemes and that the benefits weren't, um, you know, weren't captured by more elite farming groups. Um, and I think we achieved all of that through, uh, through that CRA process. Another example and quite typical a flood risk management scheme in, um, in a small island developing state. So this time um, the Nadi flood alleviation scheme in Fiji. Um, this is the kind of project that's often deemed, um, you know, a, a, a climate finance adaptation project. Um, but this is a complicated one because it involves the Asian Development Bank, JICA and the World Bank that are trying to um, sort out problems in, in, in Nadi, which are, are significant in terms of river flooding and sea level rise. Um, and, and, and what I think ADB's involvement in that project ensured, we did quite a, a very detailed 
um, risk assessment that included a, a lot of the um, the most recent regional mean sea level rise data from CNIT, CMIT 5 and afterwards. Um, and we made sure that that was included in all the project design as well as allowances for climate change and that all of the engineers working for the different organisations were aware of the risks, had tested the options um, and included that in the overall project. <coughs> Another example um, where there's a lot of um, climate adaptation claims in the sort of water supply sector. So in Laos, um, I've worked on um, water supply projects that provide water treatment works, water distribution systems and sort of first time access to possible water for, for communities. Um, in this example, um, the adaptation claim was related to water efficiency and leakage reduction, providing drainage and sanitation villages and flood protection of the water supply works. Um, in this particular case, um, a lot of use of global and regional products to sort of do hydrological assessments of various catchments and a success I think of this one was that we um, enabled thorough checking of the source yields of where water is abstracted in, in, in a large number of catchments and we tested um, those yields against future climate change scenarios in, in, in a way that was, was, was fairly you know was new for Lao and, and more detailed than would have happened without the CRA. So again, that's quite a sort of, I think, a positive um, impact that the CRA had on that project design. So moving a bit more on to the sort of adaptation and finance examples. Um, just some context. Um, every year, or at least every couple of years, the banks um, present um, their sort of financial commitments to climate action. Um, so this is a, a, an infograph from the 2019 report, which I think was published by EBRD. Um, and it, it shows a, a total of 61 billion in finance, um, but 41 billion for low income and middle income economies. And, and, and as stated previously, if we look at the adaptation finance figures, they are somewhat lower than the mitigation finance figures. And in the low middle income countries column, which is the first one, you can see that most of this investment is in the built environment, water and wastewater systems, and then some categories which include institutional capacity support and technical assistance compared to the higher income economies where it's far more focused on coastal and, and river flood management infrastructure. So um, some of these later examples of risk assessments, I've been a lot more involved in the climate finance calculations and, and, and that side of thing. Um, but ADB have, have, have recently committed to, to, to lending money to Chennai, so an so Indian mega city, which is exposed to extreme sea levels, um, stormwater flooding and, and, and river flooding. And um, it's a, uh, I mean, the Indian government, I think, wants to invest probably around $400 million in improving the infrastructure, um, the water infrastructure in Chennai. Um, this ADB loan was up to, it was $237 million US dollars. Um, it was providing stormwater drainage to large areas of the city, um, improving channels, providing more storage in water tanks within the city area. Um, and a, a big em emphasis on, on recharge pits um, and sort of water recycling, water reuse, emergency plans and capacity building. And what was interesting about this project um, was that um, there was quite good satellite data of historic floods. Um, and some of that and some of the engineering design work enabled us to assess the impact of the project um, not just for the sort of baseline situation, but for a whole range of uh, future climate change scenarios and demonstrate that even though this is really quite basic stormwater drainage, the project would have a positive impact under a range of future scenarios um, because it, you know, it does remove a large volume of water from the city in a whole range of events with both high return periods and under future climate change scenarios. So that was an interesting aspect. The other one was... Um, you know, I think I learned working working in India, um, you can't kind of translate your your, your Western view of, of what 
adaptation of a drainage system might look like um, to an Indian context. It's really very different because the hydrology is very different, the context is different. And actually a lot of the guidance in India, they're not in favor of adding large allowances to make their systems larger and have a greater capacity to cope with heavier rainfall. There's a much stronger emphasis on providing um, water recycling, recharge, rainwater harvesting. So if you look at the national engineering guidelines, that's what they're pushing. Uh, they're not pushing the kind of concept of add 20% to your drainage system design and things, things like that, that we do more in, in, in the UK and Europe. Um, but again, it's a very interesting project and there's a lot more work to do um, to protect Chennai. Um, another, another water project, um, I've worked in Tamil Nadu in, on the Kalvary Delta, um, which is a, again a really interesting area, a very interesting project. Um, it's downstream of one of the oldest irrigation structures in the world. It's a really important agricultural area um, and is affected by um, sea level rise, coastal intrusion and incursion at the, the coastal side of irrigation schemes and, and, and uh, frankly a completely dilapidated irrigation system that was sort of last updated by the the British during colonial times. So it's now being rehabilitated and the projects are very much focused on providing better um, flood embankments, um, considering the overall water balance and, uh, and improving irrigation structures throughout the whole system, uh, which has the effect of increasing the reliability of water supply, particularly for um, the most vulnerable farmers, I think at the end the tail enders really in the um, irrigation system that are living in areas with um, saline groundwater and they rely on um, the delivery of, of water from um, upstream areas including upstream states to, to, to grow their crops. And I think the, the, the success of that risk assessment was, um, was really just making sure that the whole hydrological water cycle was considered and it wasn't just thought of as a, as a drainage project or irrigation project um, and again just making sure that um, everyone was aware of the latest climate change science and risks for that part of India. One final example, a slightly different one, um, again in, in Tamil Nadu, is that I've supported on some um, social housing projects across the region. So this is an example of what we call a sector loan, where the, the bank lends money to the, the regional government for projects in a, a large number of cities. So this project is about providing affordable housing for vulnerable communities, in, in, you know, including, um, you know, removing informal housing that's developed you know within within rivers and, and and in you know very hazardous locations and getting people into uh, social housing with proper facilities um, providing affordable housing for lots of migrant workers um, and providing better regional planning and this one's interesting because we really got into looking at the risks of heat waves in these kinds of um, developments and the adaptations included were actually really um, you know really good design in the context of India compared to other social housing projects I, I saw in the region so the buildings um, very much designed for passive cooling lots of water efficiency features um, lots of sustainable drainage features community gardening livestock shelters etc um, and actually for that one was it was interesting that the um, because of the I think the quality of the design was 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 so high um, the climate finance was deemed to be about 25 percent of the whole the whole loan um, and that um, you know included both the, the the adaptation measures related to extreme heat but also um, some of the mitigation measures related to daylighting use of leds um, and, and so on there's a lot of water recycling in that project a lot of recycling wastewater um, and using it for irrigation and other purposes so, you know, in my view, those are all pretty, you know, relatively successful examples, but I just want to reflect on, on those and the overall system um, based on that experience. So going back to some of the critiques I mentioned earlier, um, I'm presenting a sort of overall summary here and you know, looking at these projects and, you know, obviously the, the, the clear claims that the adaptation finance isn't enough. I think that's, 
clearly is the case. So I'd have to agree with that. In all of these examples, um, there was still an enormous need to extend similar types of projects to other communities or to improve the standard of protection that's provided because sometimes it's still very low. Um, so there's certainly a, a big adaptation gap. And I think the, 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 the really interesting area there is when we go in and advise on adaptation is whether we should be um, you know, really pushing for you know, very high quality projects in small areas that benefit a small number of people or whether we, should, we, we, we kind of accept you know, we actually need to extend that money to, to a larger number of communities. So I think there's a need sometimes to avoid sort of gold plating the adaptation in some of those projects so benefits are spread out a bit further. Um, in terms of maladaptation, um, I mean, this is quite a challenging area and it's always hard to eliminate risks, but I would say that the risks of maladaptation in the projects I've been involved with is, is very low um, and it's not the case in most projects. I think it's interesting in you know, the large flood risk management examples like Fiji that it has to go alongside much stronger um, planning policy to prevent development in areas that are protected by um, flood defences. That's always a risk and it's a risk and it happens in the UK as well as any developing country context. Um, and in the irrigation projects with a large coastal element, it's, um, you know, it's clear that there's a you know, there's that there's a there's a need to grow uh, food and support large farming communities in in, the, in these areas, um, and it's very hard to get people to consider sort of coastal realignment and actually stepping back. Um, and you know, with irrigation, that means that uh, strong emphasis on getting your 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 um, your tail tail end structures, you know, still quite close to the sea. So that that presents some some issues. Um, but overall, the risk of maladaptation, in my view, on the projects I've worked on is very low. In, in terms of overstating climate finance and those claims that, you know, there is very clear guidance called the MDB Common Framework on Climate Finance. And if you follow the framework, it's really hard, virtually impossible to overstate the finance. It's very conservative. Um, however, um, the guidance as it stands is, isn't very practical um, because it's based largely on estimating the incremental costs of climate change adaptation, which is quite involved at an early design stage in a project. So you don't always have the information you need to do that. So in, you know, what that means is that um, individual banks you know, develop their own methods sometimes and individual consultants may take slightly different approaches. So that's more of a methodological problem. If you stick to the, the, the guidance, it's very difficult to overstate the finance. Um, so does the, overall, does the overall apparatus, the overall system work? Um, so my personal view, and I've worked in this area for about uh, five to 10 years, is that really good progress has been made. Um, I think the market for services in this area is, uh, has matured. Um, and the capacity within the banks has grown significantly and is still growing um, so that they can manage and, and actually police, I suppose, and, and, and verify this climate action finance. Um, there are still clearly areas for some improvement um, going forward. Um, and talking to colleagues across the team, um, climate risk assessment generally occurs too late in the project design process. So sometimes it, it, it can't really influence design. And if that does happen, um, risks won't be fully addressed and you miss opportunities for adaptation and resilience. You know, we have the benefit of working for four or five multilateral development banks and we can see um, internally that sometimes commitment and capacity is, is varied both between banks and, and across departments, they're complex organisations. So, you know, what we see really is, is some very good sustainable development and climate change departments that are doing a great job um, but sometimes they still have a challenge internally to um, you know get colleagues to you know do, do, do a great job every time on, on, on climate change adaptation um, and related to that there is a bit of a varied capacity to assess the you know the quality of work done by consultants which can lead to inconsistency um, and kind of different approaches between projects and it makes it very hard to sort of compare across the board.
in general, I think assessments struggle mostly with dealing with um, compound risks or, or, or sort of wider system risks. Um, and I'll come on to this again. I mean, en engineers, if they're doing feasibility studies, are very focused on making, you know, what they're designing climate resilient and may argue that it's outside their remit to think about the wider system. So that's sometimes a challenge to, to, to take a more systems approach to, um, to these risk assessments associated with specific loans. Um, and I think still, despite the framework, there is some inconsistency in reporting between, between banks. And if, you, if you're targeted with increasing your climate finance, it's a lot easier just to fund wind farms or mitigation projects, which can be big, you know, big infrastructure items. That's much easier than, than adaptation in general and much easier than um, funding any you know, non-structural measures and capacity building. So um, you know, that, 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 that's an issue. Just a few learning points before, before I finish. Um, so you know, with these points, I think this reflects our practical experience. And you know, there, there's some agreement with some of the criticisms, but overall, I, I think I've got a more positive view of, uh, of what's going on in the banks, but I think we still need earlier engagement. Um, so not every, not every bank does things like country strategies and programs. This is more for the World Bank and ADB um, and the African Development Bank. But if you, if you get in, involved in those programs at the start, clearly you raise awareness of climate change and you identify adapt, adaptation opportunities early on. Um, you need to understand the vulnerability context in detail and obviously set appropriate goals, but that has to be aligned with national and federal strategies and guidelines. I can see Chris is on the line, probably, probably close, to, close to my time. Um, but strong engagement with social environmental safeguards staff is really helpful. And I found it really beneficial working with um, local national consultants in India um, who are becoming you know, quite skilled at risk assessment and adaptation assessment and also working with local NGOs. And there's always a mechanism for that in these loan projects. There is, an, there is engagement of NGOs. Um, important to try and adopt a wider systems view and always seek opportunities to enhance the value of projects. So this is easy early on if you're involved in early design, but it's also possible if you're brought in later because often we can recommend additional grant aid, grant aid projects to promote sort of nature-based adaptation or, 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 or other forms of climate change adaptation, e even at a later stage and, and help the government or the state apply for more climate finance. And finally, I think it's important to, um, you know, obviously have good monitoring and verification, but that can be mandated through often through the loan process. So we make sure that we do track the performance of these projects and we learn from what works well and what doesn't. So thank you. I think that's, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um... I'm sure um, hard to get a round of applause of these things, but um, uh, I, I think you can, you can imagine it. Um, it was very insightful and interesting, and great to get your practical experience on on um, on these real world projects and um, your your reflections on that. I'll open it up to, to questions for the next um, fifteen minutes or so. Uh, please use the chat or raise a hand. I'm just going to make sure I can see enough people to do that. Uh, while waiting for questions to trickle in, um, I thought I'd kick off with a very quite a brief one. You mentioned that, the, that there's quite a conservative um, or um, uh, view on on level of, of risk in terms of adaptation, uh, like is in over over emphasizing the risk, um, which maybe kind of negates this question. But there's been a bit of discussion about whether RCP 8.5 or this kind of very high level outcome warming outcome by the end of the century and uh, just just past it is a useful way of thinking about climate change risk if that's a an unrealistic um scenario to to be benchmarking resilience and adaptation against i don't know if you had a view on that from um how you've applied things like these these risks um in practice yeah i mean i think um 
I mean, what we normally do is, you know, we argue that we're doing a risk assessment and it's good practice to, you know, always present a, a range of scenarios and try and promote things like adaptive pathways. And I've done that on some of the risk assessments. But at the end of the day, I'm after, I'm after, um, you know, I really want people to consider climate change. So on the whole, I present RCP 8.5 results for the 2050s, which is the typical horizon that is used for these loans. So and 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 and, if it, and also present RCP 4.5. But um, you know, if if I can, I try and stress test and ensure whatever's being proposed is 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 you know can cope with RCP 8.5 scenarios. And, and the only, I mean, it's different in every country. So obviously some countries have developed their own national guidance of guidelines or federal guidelines, that, which state what scenarios should be used in infrastructure projects. So Vietnam has a national law that states what you should be doing. So you can't, you know, you, if that's the case, you've got to align, you've got to align with that. Um, but one risk, I, one thing I've, I've really found out, which is, you know, it, it, it is, is worrying and is bad practice is that, um, and in areas like sea level rise, you get consultants coming in using data that's say 20 years old and they haven't read the late, they haven't even read CMIT 5, they're going back to CMIT 3 and they're presenting data which is which is clearly wrong. And what we always try and do is encourage the use of the latest climate change science from IPCC and you know various programs from the UK and Australia and elsewhere. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um to me um Rohit has a hand up um you can take your question and we'll go to you thank you uh hello everyone my name is Rohit my question is to Steve and I would like to know uh how do these uh, uh, screening criteria align with the task force for climate disclosures TCFD uh, criteria that the MDBs and certainly uh, I know for sure uh, EBRD are going to report on on TCFD um, related disclosures. So how do these align with them? Thank you. Yeah, well, I suppose you know the banks like ADB were doing have been doing climate risk assessments and developing their systems. I think long before TCFD came along. So now what we're seeing is a sort of a more of a, a merging of existing risk assessment approaches and reporting approaches and a sort of, you know, more of a merging and blending with TCFD seems to be the thing that's getting the most traction. So from a risk assessment perspective, uh, you know, I think that that's framed more in terms of ensuring you look at, you know, two degree and four degree scenarios and it has very specific requirements. So, um, I would say everyone's aware of it and things are sort of coming together slowly. I, in my work experience, I'm seeing, you know, a fast convergence of TCFD and adaptation reporting in the UK and Europe. They're becoming very quickly becoming the same thing. Um, I, 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 I think multilateral development banks have their own, have their own systems and they'll be mostly focused on making sure that there's consistency across banks will be the main focus. Whereas TCFD might be seen as something more for the private sector. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, hi, hi, Steve. Good hi, to see Steve. you again. Um, Steve, just wondering, you know, you mentioned the um, adaptation pathways. I mean, I see that more as a as a system scale adaptation measure. I mean, if these if these are individual investments and in infrastructure interventions which are being evaluated. How do you reconcile the sort of single system mitigation adaptation options, which are sometimes more limited to the more system scale ones? And, and how, how, how does this, this emerging field deal with system scale versus project by project intervention for adaptation and mitigation? Yeah, I guess, I guess the best example of that was the um, sort of, you know, my attempt to introduce that into, into that kind of thinking into the Vietnam work. So I suppose when you're working on irrigation, you're always doing it in, in, in the context of a wider catchment. So, um, so, so you're, you're, you're considering the catchment as a whole. And in that project, um, you know, we, 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 we highlighted the importance of understanding that specific investment and that abstraction compared to all the other abstractions in the catchment and what else was going on. 
um, and you know the level of you know what we managed to do we used the um, I mean it, it, a lot of the thinking emerged originally from the UK but I used the work I think it was Bosman Worth Australian publications to you know promote a, they, they presented quite a nice paper of stepping through and you know how do you do an adaptation pathway approach and I very much promoted that with um, the Ministry of Water in Vietnam and, and, and ADB and I suppose the only impact that had the positive impact it had is they recognized the need to improve a lot of their monitoring um, and kind of accepted that you know they they would need to um, you know have additional investment in specific things depending on which direction the hydrological cycle took because like many countries um, that even the direction of hydrological change in in, in Vietnam is is, unver is highly uncertain so we could be getting more floods and droughts more droughts or just more floods I mean so um, you know it, it, it's not fully reconciled Julian and and, and and the tools aren't that sophisticated um, and you have to bear in mind that I suppose the the amount of effort that goes into a standard risk assessment for 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 for, for a loan, um, the due diligence piece might be, you know, fifteen days to forty five days work for 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 an experienced consultant. Now, if you're if you're building something like a hydropower dam, then of course you've got an engineering feasibility study, and if you're going to take a really detailed view of or, or, or systems and pathways it, it would need to be done as part of the engineering feasibility study and you know those studies might cost half a million to a million dollars and in those studies you can do really detailed modeling but in in the climate risk assessment due diligence piece you you, you don't really get the opportunity to get to to get quite so detailed you need to be working with the end you know ideally you're working with the engineers and you're making sure that they're doing a good job but that doesn't actually sit in the, the terms of reference that I get to do a CRA, if that makes sense. Was that Australian study? Sorry? The Australian Adaptive Pathways, uh, which was? Um, it, I, I, it was, I think it was Bridget Bosmanworth. I'll send you the link, Julian. It's, um, it's part of the Australia, it was part of the Australian Adaptation sort of research program. Um, but I'll, I'll, I can dig that out for you. Okay, cheers. It's not a mathematic. It's 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 not a mathematical modelling piece. It's more a sort of presented as a way of thinking in some of that work. So so very pragmatic and high level. Cheers. Thanks for the question, Julian. Um, are there any other questions? We've probably got time for one more. Um, I see Paul. Um, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Hi there. Um, hopefully you can hear me. It's Paul Munda here from um, S and P Global Ratings. Um, uh, Steve, I, I wanted just to kind of get your view, if I can, on um, the, the CBI, the Climate Bonds Initiative. They, they recently released a set of um, climate resilience principles, uh, and I wondered if you if you had a view on on kind of how useful they they may be, or, or indeed not, um, with regard to kind of scaling up adaptation finance. Uh, I'm not. Which principles are those? There's so many. There's so many guidelines and principles and, and different things being published. I I I'm, I don't necessarily keep track of them all. Which, which ones were those, Paul? So from the CBI, the Climate Bonds Initiative, a, a set of climate resilience principles were released a couple of years ago now, I think. Um, and there's a set of kind of working groups that have been pulled together to um, to try and distill those into a set of kind of sector um, uh, uh, sector based approaches. So. You know, um, so there's work on in kind of the water sector, for example, at the moment. The idea being um, that if you're if you're wanting to kind of release a, a you know a climate resilience bond, for example, um, that that they may be a, a way to try and um, inform that, that that kind of process. And the, the EBRD, of course, have have used that in their um, their, their resilience bond that they released uh, in 2019. So I, it, it may be that you're not familiar with them, but if you are, then I'd, I'd certainly welcome your view on their their utility. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not very um i'm not really up to speed with those paul because that's more james james dunham's um m more james's area than, than than mine um but i mean i think you know i, I kind of welcome a lot of the the guidance I, I i do from my kind of natural sciences engineering original engineering background i mean my my view of a lot of this is it is, is a lot of it's been done already and it's being reinterpreted and and, and, and so on so I, I don't know perhaps you can you, you can tell us whether there's anything you know fundamentally new or different in that set of guidance but I think if people are um, 
you know, risk assessment and adaptation practitioners, they followed various kind of good practice from, you know, the UK Climate Impacts Programme days and, and before. And in my view, a lot of these, a lot of the new guidelines are very similar. They, they adopt very similar principles. And I, I don't generally see anything hugely different in what's in some of the new new things coming out. But but but, but I may stand corrected. Yeah, no, I think that's um, yeah, yeah, that's that's fair to say. I think it's it, um, they're very much aligned to kind of um, some of the existing frameworks that they see that come out through the MDBs, for example. But um, but yeah, okay, I'll get in contact with James. Okay, cheers. Um, so, in the interest of of finishing a time for people on lunch breaks, etc., um, I think we'll thanks everyone for the questions and thank you, Stephen, for the answers as well as the presentation. I um, don't know if people can find their reaction buttons, but people can express their appreciation for Stephen um, in that way as well, because um, that was a very interesting, um, very interesting presentation. It sounds like there are further conversations to have there um, uh, with that. So um, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, uh, can I say a big thank you to Amrita Sidhu, um, who makes these possible, uh, and to flag that we have uh, Another one uh, in May. Uh, let me just get the, the brief in front of me. Um, the, on the, the 20th of May, um, which is titled Medical Supply Chains in the Climate Emergency. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Stephanie Sidero, who is a lecturer in climate responses to climate crises at the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, University of Manchester. So um, another um, really interesting talk uh, on the cards, um, sort of same sort of time, 1 p.m. on the 20th of May. Um, hope to see many of you there again. Um, oh, sorry, Rohit, did you have a? No, sorry. Oh, no, sorry, uh, no worries. Um, so in that case, I think we can um, bring things to a close. Um, thanks again, Stephen.